Bruce Willoughby, welcome back to the Business of Betting podcast. Jake, it's been over a year, uh, and in that year, I've really enjoyed listening to all, to, to all the intervening episodes, learned a lot as a result, and I'm keen to have another chat with you and sort of update you as to what's gone on in that year for me, because it has been fairly significant, and uh, I'm really looking forward to what, what's ahead. Me too. It goes quick. I couldn't believe it was it was over 12 months since we spoke last for an episode, yeah. and it's uh it's interesting I'm, i've been doing round two interviews with some people and i'm very mm. very much looking forward to this i know we had a, a lot of good feedback previously and un- unfortunately we didn't get to touch on enough i would say round one so we've obviously got some time today to do round two but before we get stuck into some of the uh the follow-up questions from last time and some more additional topics do you want to just uh tell us what the last 12 months has entailed and and some interesting thoughts or observations throughout that time yeah, I'm a person that really believes in authenticity in one's approach to life. In other words, not to try to represent yourself in some way that's not consistent with the way you actually see yourself. And so I suppose over the years, having been in the media, racing media, horse racing media specifically for 30 years, I became increasingly unsure of the the the, the, the space I actually occupied and whether I was still doing any good, if you will. And I'd basically put my ideas out there and I'd had feedback with people about them and the the topic has moved on an awful lot. But as time had gone on, I became more uncertain as to what, uh, whether I was happy to continue to to do this. And I suppose today's world of interactivity is great from the point of view of the advancement of ideas. But the drawback is that one can spend so much time in interactivity that one doesn't have enough time to actually do the, 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 the copious amounts of research that I'm very fond of. And so that was the first thing that made me decide that I would really draw in the strings of my media career. And for 20 odd years, I've been appearing two or three times a week on television. And I decided that I'd had enough of that. And that was no longer something that was rewarding for me. And I scaled back the writing jobs that I did. And I still have a, a couple of jobs I'm very fond of. And the other factor was that my son, Joss, who was born severely autistic, was beginning to enter his teenage years. And as any parent out there who has to deal with, uh, especially teenage boys who are um, on the autism spectrum, these are very challenging and rewarding times. And about 10 years ago, I started to read quite a lot of material about his condition and I became increasingly sort of guilty that I wasn't given as much time to actually trying to help him in the fullest way that I could. And so I put that decision to kind of scale back my uh, media commitments more and more. And I suppose eventually about a year ago now, I decided enough was enough and that I was gonna make not a clean break from the media, but as clean a break as I could muster while still having enough residual income you know, to <laughs> to buy food. And so um, in the last year, I spent an awful lot of time, a lot more time than I've ever done, both observing and trying to understand my son's condition and also, of course, the rest, the rest of my family too. But also uh, in that in the time that wasn't a, I wasn't able to do that, to doing even more research into horse racing related projects and data analytic projects to do with horse racing and I found that the last year of my life, both both because of being close to my family, more close to my family than ever before, and because closer to what I've actually always really enjoyed, which is just the the individual pursuit of knowledge. As we talked about last time, I was on the pods that we started with my grandfather and as, uh, as progressed since. It's been a lifetime where the thing I like to do the most is to try to learn something really difficult. And there's nothing more difficult than trying to understand and help um, a child of yours who has autism. And so um, the last year has been the most rewarding of my entire existence for both reasons. I'm guessing, even though it might be unequivocally a, a great decision in hindsight and at the time, is there a is there anything you miss? Is there a void? Is there something that is left behind that you, you still grasp for? Or are you absolutely solely focused and this is this is a great new path for you? Let me just bounce that question back to you slightly by saying, how easy do you think it is 
to optimize in mathematical language how easy do you think it is jake to optimize the function of your own life how close do you think we get generally speaking i would say it's nigh on impossible yeah i would agree with that completely but i think what happens is we get distracted we start off with simple lives as children in which we do things that sort of we find stimulating about the world in my case it was always playing with cards and dice and things that were associated with numbers and probability. And then we take on these, this more, much more complicated life that we have to involve in relationships and growing up and having careers and all those things. And I suppose in the end, at the end of our lives, we kind of, as we, we seek to evaluate ourselves ever more philosophically, and maybe we get more back, we get back more towards the things that we really enjoy doing and the things that are important to us. And I once read a thing which said, no one ever was lying on their deathbed thinking, I wish I'd done more work at the office. <laughs> and it is very true that it's difficult to actually commit yourself fully to the things that do you the most good, whether they're pursuits such as reading books and doing maths, or whether they're contributing to those who are closest to us in trying to be the best father or brother or son or whatever it is that you can be in. And I think maybe that the current crisis we find ourselves in, which people have been thrust ever more close together than they've ever been, has probably, although I preempted that period, but uh, just by chance, um, there've probably been times when many other people around the world have come to those same realizations about their own life. And it'll be very interesting to see how society reorganizes itself in the wake of what we've all gone through when we do pass through it, to see whether there are any revisions to our general behaviors. Well, in my field, the legal profession, winning, in yeah. quotation marks, is going through university, getting good grades, getting a job offer at a top 20 law firm, climbing the, the ranks there. And I'm guessing if you survey anyone at those top law firms from a happiness perspective, I'm guessing there's a fair few that are miserable. So... Even yeah. if you're in quotation marks winning in my field, there is a, a large populace of that that isn't necessarily, um, and not to say they don't have wealth or they don't have power or they don't have many great aspects that come with what they want to do, but I think the the underlying thought behind what you're talking about may not always be there in, in, in my field. This segues back to one of the points we talked about last time, which was the idea that the racing media always projects the consumption of horse racing as being this ide idealized pursuit of the way of the professional better. Never back odds on favorites, always be careful, never chase your losses, all those things, which of course are important for problem gambling as well. But we talked about the idea that, that a large part of the equity in following horse racing is fun. And fun through stimulation, through playing around with ideas, through observing of things in uh, horse racing, which are also common to other pursuits in finance and in psychology. But that fun aspect, I was saying, I, I feel is that something that horse racing's lost touch with to a great extent. And when you watch a horse racing broadcast and it's associated with the idea of fun, fun seems to be this kind of vicarious idea that as you're watching people larking around and enjoying themselves, that the viewer is supposed to have fun as a result, seeing kind of people exchange banter and things like that. Well, yeah, that definitely is fun in small measures. But what's kind of a deeper fun is the idea of why people, is exploiting the idea of why people are watching horse racing in the first place. What is it that turns them on to even putting the television on or the computer on? And that is that in some way they've become entangled with the idea that horse racing and its uncertainty is a fascinating topic that, that a horse race starts with all the horses lined up uniformly. Uh, and then when the stalls open, we really don't know what's going to happen. And I was saying last time, I feel like that that idea of like being honest with yourself about what is it you want? Are you ruthlessly pursuing profit? Or are you just trying to have a good time? I think that can be generalized to life itself. And I think certainly in my case, it's something I've increasingly thought about over the last few years. I've thought, do I really want to be a racing journalist anymore? You know, what was the point of it in the first place? Well, the point was, and we did discuss this last time too, 
the point in my case was I come from a family of teachers and in my own function of trying to get something out of life I like the idea of kind of like starting off a, a discussion by extolling some ideas and then seeing what people think about those ideas and I guess about a year ago I must have come to the end of that process because I no longer wanted to do it what do you think took so long to get there and obviously there's many societal and and other factors that go into it obviously you mentioned your son might be a catalyst for for a lot of it but you know 10 years ago talking to James why not then you know that type of discussion yeah really good question I mean you talked about about lawyers and the process of their careers the trajectory of their careers well I suppose when I started off as a racing journalist the first thing I thought of was that I wanted to be the the greatest punter on planet Earth. I thought that was the that was a, a totally mistaken ideal. You know, I thought it wasn't because I was after riches, but I wanted people to sort of think, realize that kind of the, the mathematical sort of purity of of statistics of of like the scientific approach to horse racing could be could sweep across horse racing itself and transform this as a study and make it a lot more interesting for everybody and kind of like really sort of catapult horse racing into an age beyond that which it had at the time which was very much a traditional age back in the 1980s and that was a grandiose ambition really it was that of many people have as young people um, and I suppose that it, it didn't sustain me for very long when reality came calling which was basically that it was hard to make progress in racing journalism and I never really thought that I would be the chief correspondent of the trade paper or I never really thought I'd be on TV for 20 years. I'd never had intentions like that. I was always a very shy individual as a teenager. The idea of kind of like being a media inverted commas star in small letters is, you know, was, was never really my idea. And I became increasingly disquiet about that, about as, year, as the time went on. And I suppose in the end, I lost touch with doing the amount of study that, that, that persuaded me of my own status I began to feel a bit phony about the, under, the true understanding of the sport, and I think, and, and other sports too, and I think that's one of the, the things, apart, as well as my son, that really convinced me of the decision, and that's why it wasn't to answer your question ten years ago. Interesting, because you talked about fun, and it was something I wanted to, to bring up in this conversation. Do you think we've potentially mismanaged that part of the equation when it comes to, to racing, when it comes to gambling, you know, sports, this entire ecosystem. Do you think that's part of the, I guess, evolution over the last couple of decades where it might've been a pushback or, you know, we've pursued progress, we've pursued other things relentlessly and ruthlessly. And that fun aspect, which is probably the reason why we all got started, or at least before we can, you know, analytically think of racing in the way we do or gambling in the way we do, that was probably one of the main catalysts. Yeah, I strongly think that. And I'd point to the success of this podcast. What is it that makes this podcast good to listen to? Well, it's the fact that people have individual approaches to the sport, but they've clearly thought about their existence an awful lot and they're able to exchange ideas about that and to and in many cases to very eloquently put forward things that make you think when you listen. Now, I think there was a massive gap in the space for something like that. And that's why you're still going after 130 episodes. But I think that it's a much more general, it can be used much more generally uh, within the sport. I think we've got away from that. I think perhaps what happened in Britain, the trajectory of race thought about racing in Britain was that it, for so long, it was stubbornly reluctant to embrace modern ideas. And then all of a sudden, about 20 years ago, when these kind of general pop science books began to appear and we got hold of the Bayer books and things like that from other uh, David Edelman's books and stuff like that, we, we began to accelerate the, prog the process of the, sort of the scientific approach to horse racing really fast. But in the process, we left many people in the audience behind and we didn't really learn a way to stimulate the the brains of people in the right way and so what we're left with now is a very very superficial product in this country we've got a vast number of people who understand horse racing at a very deep level bet in a highly sophisticated way and are very very capable individuals 
but they're left to cluster on the internet for the most part. They're left to discuss their ideas in cyberspace. And it's not that they are sufficiently populous to carry the economic realities of the sport. It's the point that they're wasted as a resource. It's that there should be many, there should be thousands more people who are somewhere in between their sophisticated approach and that that we're getting served up on the television on a regular basis. Now, not to throw everybody under the bus by any means, there's some fine contributors to the space currently, but it's fair to say that racing's product media product has stalled this is certainly true in this country i can't speak for others as actually yes i can speak for america that's probably gone backwards even more it's stalled to the point that you can recognize in some of the media contributors who uh, get on now similar traits to the 1980s and that we seem in although there's a an increasingly uh, numerous number of people who really understand horse racing i don't think we generalize in their ideas to the mainstream sufficiently well to make horse racing as interesting as it could be. Do you have a sense of what might be one of the causes behind that? Because I think to get to the positions you've been in and some of your colleagues around the world as well, you cannot be uh, lacking knowledge in racing, I would say. You cannot be oblivious to how gambling works. You cannot be rising the ranks in those situations, I would say generally anyway, uh, to put yourself in those positions without that acumen what do you think it is that that is one of the driving causes to making it so that we are talking about it in this way well maybe it's the superficiality of the modern media in general across the board maybe it seems that that knowledge has become more compartmentalized in other words there's far more out there if you have a really sophisticated brain to satisfy you you can do endless courses online. You can read blogs written by highly intelligent people in whatever field you're interested in online. But it, there seems to have been this almost bifurcation of approaches where the middle has got lost a bit more. And that kind of this has been seen a lot during this crisis in that it's understanding life and death and those profundities and the probabilities associated with them, according to numbers, which we're served up on a daily basis, deaths, um, infections and things like that of coronavirus, has reminded us on a daily basis how important it is that we, un that we have those skills as a society. And I think that mathematically, there is no doubt whatsoever that we've gone backwards. And my evidence for this is that if you pick up a mathematics textbook from a secondary school in the uh, curriculum in about from the 19 post-war times 1960s 19, 1950s 1960s in there would be calculus in there would be the secondary school child being taught how to differentiate how to integrate how to do logarithms and now those things have been pushed back to further on in uh, and the reason that is not that educators have missed their uh, um, missed their chance to do that. It's that the world has become much more a, a, away from quantitative methods generally, but specifically in a small number of people, that interest has grown, as I say. So I feel like the middle ground, there are more people in society who are scared of equations and are scared of numbers. And if you've ever published a book or tried to get a book published and you have an equation in there, you'll know what I mean. Because people say, well, that, that's just, you know, that's going to put at least a thousand people off. The fact they've used Y equals X plus two. And, and I think that, that that then translates to these advanced, what we're talking about here in terms of these, the ways to understand sports, that there's a small number of people who are really accelerating the understanding of sports in football, in basketball, in the NFL. And then there's a gap to people who kind of either haven't got the energy to understand it in that way and they basically just want to release from their daily grind they don't really want to think of horse racing as an academic pursuit and those or there's those who basically just just don't, don't like doing that sort of thing because it's just not their sort of thing and so i think that this has resulted in a media for sport which although it suits p 
people very well and does a very good job for a small number of people, it's not maximizing its reach across the board. So I think it's an interesting point and I, I'm even guilty. You know, I, I find joy sometimes in talking about things like homogenous pricing and, and whatever else. And yeah, that diverts me, I would say, and probably the listeners away from fun. And let's talk about that middle section you referenced. How wide yeah. do you think or, or what spectrum is that middle section? And this may not be the right way to ask, but how approachable are they or how reachable do you think they can be? I think they're extremely reachable. I think people are much, much more sophisticated, capable of much more sophisticated understanding of things like, like horse racing and sports than is presupposed by media moguls and by people who drive content in our newspapers and on our, on our televisions. For example, there are many things that we rely on, such as telephone engineers, such as people to mend things, products in our house, that we're not capable of approaching in a million years. We wouldn't know where to start. Yet, yet. People in Britain particularly think that horse racing has to be kept at a certain level to maximize its reach. To me, those, those two uh, realities, are that, that they, it doesn't make sense. It, that, that it's just that I think that people are not being fed sufficient amount of detail. And an example I always give here is American football. American football has grown significantly in this country and in territories like Australia too and around the world. And yet... How much time do broadcasters put into explaining the rules? Virtually none. They, they rely on people who have become interested in it to look things up for themselves. And so if you want to understand the NFL at a deeper level, then you have to spend the time reading the right people online, buying books. In my case, as a young lad, I used to buy the NFL record and fact book every year, go through that, and learn about different positions and like how there were different weights and heights and athletic traits associated with them all. And I went from there to a lifelong passion of, of American sports in general, baseball and uh, hockey and basketball. I like all of them. And I contribute and, and, I, and I, in the space, I spend money on things like the different TVs that you can subscribe to. And so I become a consumer of these sports just because they offered enough to interest me in the first place. And I think like horse racing specifically, because that's obviously my uh, specific uh, specialist topic it does an absolutely terrible job at that it assumes the audience first of all haven't got that capacity it doesn't provide them with any kind of data that they can model free of charge data is extremely expensive it's one of the it's an absolute scandal that that you have to spend as much as 60 or 70 pounds a month to get decent data and if you're interested in foreign racing in particular the, the same seems to apply um, and there's no way in that that betters are bound to end up being unsophisticated, the best semi sophisticated because they can't the first can't get to really teach to how to they're under the scientific approach to horse and things they don't have to have they don't take, have to take to the nth degree but even just gives people so much satisfaction to understand in things like football, if you've only got to stand on the terraces in football, if you ask someone next to you, what do you think I, of like Reading's first team choice in my, in my case, you will get a 15 minute dissertation of their tactical approach because football fans have got over the years for, have got that sort of impetus to understand through standing on the terraces. And in, foot, in, in horse racing, we don't provide any way in beyond the absolute basic for the vast number of our consumers. And it's no surprise that they increasingly turn to other sports. Do you think it's an unenviable task to balance? I mean, we talk about on this podcast all the time what it takes to be a professional or a, a potentially a winning better gambler, whatever you want to call it. You know, you've got to be methodical. You've got to be analytical. Yeah. You've got to be probably boring is the right word, let's just say, versus the fun aspect. But also, I think the, the main thing where the, the, the crossover might sit or the intersection is around overall engagement and I guess finding a balance. Do you think that's yeah. achievable or is it a, a task that obviously we're not really exploring, I would say generally uh, across different mediums, but do you think it's something that is, I guess, achievable in the short and medium term? I think that I would have to admit in my own case that after 30 years, I would admit failure. I would make utter and complete failure in my own case to get my ideas across 
to the mainstream. Now, maybe that's because in horse racing in Britain, it's incredibly difficult for anyone to do it. Maybe it's just that I'm not very persistent uh, or, or some other factor. But yet to answer your question, I think it is difficult. But I think that it's something that the sport just needs to put more time into doing. Because I think that, that when we talk about horse racing to other people, and something I've done an awful lot of over the years, is that there's nothing more enjoyable than for someone to tell you something that stimulates your mind, something you hadn't thought about, something that like is stimulates you to actually learn a bit more about the, the whatever it is they're talking about. So, for example, one of the things I've always really being skeptical about is paddock the physical appearance of horses in the paddock and one of the things i do when i sit in front of the television is i write down what people say and keep a record of what they say and i try i put it into a into a database into a, um, an sql database alongside all my other alongside all the other fields and i try and use it as a factor i try and then use some text mining analytics to try to understand whether does anybody say anything before a race about the appearance of a horse that's useful or is it all just kind of window dressing um, and I've not been able to derive anything particularly useful uh, so far out of doing that process but I'd be, I'm intrigued to find that, that, that there are people who believe that academically this can be done you know there are experts in America say for example or in Australia in particular I've heard about who are you know who are paid vast amounts of money by syndicates to give their um, analysis from the live from the paddock and that's another thing that we don't get across if, if that if it's possible to do that we should always try to externalize that so that the audience have got um, a greater grasp of it in a sort of more honest and authentic way but the problem i think we're getting around to talking about here you and i is that the problem is that externalizing your expertise in horse racing if you if your primary function is a better is suicide in that way isn't it because then you'll find it even more difficult than it currently is to find an outlet for your for your wagering so people it, it tends to foster a culture of secrecy and privacy so um maybe that's another factor that we should admit yeah absolutely i wanted to get your thoughts on on self-assessment and and around this topic because you know obviously we all progress through our betting careers very very differently whether it's recreational only or, or other aspects from mm. your perspective or observations do you have a sense i guess the makeup of someone whether you're analytical whether you have intuitive sense that is compatible let's say with horse racing or betting do you think that is a a major starting point and someone would be wise to to go through a little bit of a self-assessment to realize you know where they're starting from and, and what level they need to get to if they want to ultimately succeed and whatever success metric they're using yeah i do and it was a question you partly asked me last time and i completely failed to answer satisfactorily because i'm not sure i'm not sure how a person does it to go back to what i said earlier about how we're focused on the everybody being a professional punter and being kind of like you know very careful and methodical and everything and we miss sometimes the fact that the fun's the most important thing but I think the ob the obstacles now to being a, a person who makes a significant living out of betting and betting alone have probably never been greater. Yet the opportunities have, ne <laughs> have never been uh, more obvious in that you can bet in more places than you've ever been able to bet before. There are more things you can bet on, more markets to invest your money in, more good advice to take if that's what you want to do. But it may be that it's a misapprehension that as an industry that we're trying to foster people who are going to do that, you know, that, that, that it is so incredibly demanding what you're asking of someone to be a professional punter in the round that, it, that with no other source of income, I don't count people who are 50% or who have family wealth and just basically spend a lot of time getting rid of it. Um, but people who are actually, you know, kind of like grafting in the same way you, we all do in our jobs. And I think that's probably, I mean, you'll know the numbers better than I do from talking to people in the industry, but I would estimate the number of people who are definitely plus EV in something that they do in the long term. And it's not just down to short term positive results has been all minuscule. I would, it's well under 1% 
probably could stick another two notes there, of all people who follow that particular sport. And yet just think about how we're pitching we're pitching that we're, we're, we're trying to encourage everybody that you know the ideal of what they're doing is to is to make a positive roi but yet most people are going to find that frustrating and in the long run because they're not going to be able to do that and so i suppose to answer your question it's almost futile to actually expect people in large numbers to embody all the qualities that some of the outline humans that you've had on this podcast and we've all met in other settings who are these people who make a lot of money out of betting and who are tremendously gifted individuals and tremendously diligent individuals but they're so rare that they they just don't represent fully the personality types of uh, of anybody else that's actually consuming um the media that we're putting out there and i think the one thing that i always think is is under discussed and understood is the zero-sum nature of, of many of these markets we're talking about. Uh, and I yeah. think, like you're referencing, I think, and I'm sort of extrapolating a little bit, but it's probably time that we, certainly in the way it is now with uh, a lot of people complaining, a lot of recreational type uh, offerings, marketing machines and companies that are running sports mm. books these days, which is, you know, it is what it is, let's say. I think the alternative metrics of success are required for people to be able to be active and engage and, and partake in the industry and not necessarily automatically say yes, no, or binary winning or plus EV versus losing or not plus yeah. EV. It, there are ways that we can extract value from the overall nature of the game, whether it is learning from people like yourself and, and getting other skills, whether it is programming, whether it is you know even Excel that you can use in other things or or just to basically augment your worldview on different things and, and how probability has impacted the way you think and so on and so forth. Don't you think, though, that, that wagering pools, which obviously we need to drive to sustain the sport's economic future, aren't they... Isn't, the, isn't kind of the, the enthusiasm for the product itself a leading indicator of those things? I think so, but I think we're losing, yeah. we're losing a generation, potentially. Uh, you know, yeah. I think of racing... When I used to, when I was 19 and I was at university, I had plenty of time, plenty of spare time. Thursday afternoon or whatever it was, and the the race book would be printed. You'd you know rush to the news mm. news agency and pick it up, and that was you know the toy story. The toy store had just opened, and then I remember the first time Saturday horse racing markets opened on a Friday or a Thursday even. Yeah. IS bed and the tab or whatever it would be would would release those markets, and then there'd be a flurry of discussion and chatter at your thursday night footy training or with your friends or whatever it might be um and just those things and that that was fun that was inherently fun and that was what drove people to do it and the discussion and it wasn't forced it wasn't required you didn't need to set an alarm you didn't need to do any of those types of things it was just this is the attraction to it and i think the the potential for it to fall more towards a you know chess chess is a game that's intellectually stimulating but i would categorize it as terribly boring and others might say it's yeah. it's excellent and that's fine and i think that's the danger when you think about things like poker which i would say is since they you know found out you could put a camera in the table and see the whole cards that's obviously revolutionized things uh and there's obviously the good and bad that comes with poker but there is a competition level that that racing certainly faces across other games and if it's if it just becomes in the pool of you know a 20 something decides between poker chess uh, go uh, racing, whatever it is, then it's a very, very difficult uh, task to to win at that on the current trajectory. I would say. Would you describe what would you describe as your favorite sport to to watch? Uh, I would say NFL. Probably Aussie Rules is still yeah, like with one A, one B between those two. Yeah, yeah. I, th I think and one of the elements there probably is that the fact that there's only a 16 game regular season. Am I right? Yes, absolutely. Yeah, so there's a special element to every whatever your favorite team is or whether you just like neutrally follow the entire league. There's a special element to watching a game. The games mean something. And that is one thing in particular that they found was a problem with baseball is that to the modern mind, the games don't mean enough of the 162. They don't really have enough impact on the league standings, whereas 
a team starts 0-2 or 0-3 in the NFL, they're up against making the playoffs. Um, but what do you think that what is it in particular that drove you to become interested in the NFL? Can you, can you is it a multifactorial thing, or, could, or can you say it out loud what it is in one in, in one factor? Uh, it's a good question. I would say part of it, part of the thing with NFL that I struggle to grasp is it's the one sport where not the one sport, but probably the main sport where the coaches' acumen and level of understanding of the game is exponentially more than the precocious fan, I would say. Yeah. And I would say that I'm in that category. I'm, I'm certainly not an expert. I can't tell you about what happens when yeah. the, the uh, quarterback is audible, audibling, but but those are the things that, that fascinate me and I'm digging into and I'm trying to learn from and even just roster construction, uh, listening to GM's talk, even just the way analytics overlaps with traditional thinking, which I find entirely fascinating, um, you know, taking a running back in the first round of the draft and those discussions make me laugh and, and are interesting. Uh, and I think there's so many facets to it. Everything means something, like you said. Um, I think there's a number of different things, but I think that's, I think the, the intellectual stimulus that can come from something as simple as, as throwing a pass or running the football in an NFL game is, is interesting. I think that's a perfect summation of my own interest too. And for all the reasons you've mentioned, and there's so much scope to learn too, isn't there? You feel like, like you said, that you, whilst you can understand, if you're a 49ers fan, for example, you can, you can understand why Carl Shanahan has an edge over every other offensive mind in the league without understanding the nuances of the outside zone. Um, you can, but if you want to understand those nuances, you can find material to advance your understanding. In my case, I started in the 1980s and the first thing I did, I referred in the last podcast to a library we had up the road, which was a tremendous. And you could go up to this old librarian. If you said, oh, I'm, a, I'm interested in baseball, you know, he wouldn't throw, he wouldn't look at you as if you were a, a bit of a weirdo. He'd get you a book. And he got me some books on uh, the West Coast offense. And, you know, I knew nothing whatsoever about American football at the time. But suddenly, you know, he put a pile of books in front of me. I started reading about Bill Walsh and before him, Paul Brown, and all the sort of ideas they had of the fact that, like, he realized that passing was more efficient than rushing, but passing had um, results which were skewed to the extremes. And so he thought, well, if you, show, if you throw loads of short passes, you take out the problems of interceptions, sacks, and fumbles. And, you know, you find something that's halfway between rushing and passing and is better than both. And, you know, that as an idea, to, I, I suddenly thought, I kind of get this, but I, I want to know more. I don't really understand what the whole thing is about. And I started, like you just said, following the draft. And now all those processes that we're talking about have parallels in horse racing. They really do. From sectional times to front running, there's a, each of those ideas is just about risk optimization, isn't it? It's about you looking to win a game and then you devolve the process of victory, that sort of binary indicator of success into all its constituent elements and one by one you learn all those constituent elements and how they work and eventually the hope is you'll put it all together and understand cause and effect so perfectly that when you switch on the Chiefs playing the 49ers in the Super Bowl you'll be able to watch it like nobody else that you know you'll have such a nuanced understanding that it will give you this tremendous surge of pleasure even though if the result isn't the one you were hoping for in the end now, these things are true times a thousand in horse racing. They really are. That if you, if you can drill down and understand what wins races and the capabilities that horses have, you can appreciate jockeys and horses and trainers and the thinking that they put in to winning in just the same way. But the difference is twofold. First, it's data. And second, it's access. Horse racing has been bad on both. One of the things that strikes me about the NFL is that as a fan of these teams who have 90 players on the roster at the moment, one can find out virtually every fact about their entire lives, each of the 90 players. But more than that, if you consume the team's media to the end of the season, you will probably recognize at sight every player on the eventual 54-man roster, or you'll be able to recognize them by their voices, or even by the way they run on the field without even seeing their number. 
And that's because the NFL does a tremendous job through it because it's cash rich of providing resources and the, and that the teams and players totally understand how the vast incomes that they earn are a function of fan interest directly. And it doesn't need me to say how poor horse racing personalities have been, particularly in this country, uh, at contributing in that way. Definitely. And I'm just recalling, I've only been following the NFL for 10 or 12 years, and I remember the beginning was was Tim Tebow. He was playing at Florida. He yeah. was a megastar down there, and he was you know, touted heavily whether he was going to be a top 10 pick, or even a first-round pick, ultimately went to Denver, and, mm. and that evolution throughout certainly that playoff run and, and beating Pittsburgh and just the, just the, I guess the, from Skip Bayless all the way to whatever's the other end of the spectrum from Skip Bayless talking about that. And I think the perfect encapsulation, and it's just one moment uh, in a sporting event that has, you know, hours and hours and hours and still people talk about it is the, um, the decision not to run the ball by the Seahawks in the Super Bowl and the, ensuing yeah. uh pick malcolm yeah. butler for the patriots and they win and and you know you hear the analytics people talking about it you hear the game theorists talk about it you hear the traditional football uh coach talk about it you hear all you know previous quarterbacks you hear whoever you can ask someone what their opinion was, opinion is whether or not they should have ran the ball or not and that in and of itself uh those types of things i think if you wanted to draw parallels and maybe it's a bit loose but there are aspects in in racing and other things where digging into that uh, having people that are curious and look at it from a, a, an array of different perspectives, that's an igniting, engaging uh, discussion point. Yeah, and that's what, the, the, what, you, what we love about sport in general in the modern era, that we can reach those understa- the understanding of those things. Now, like, with that, we could go on forever. I know we could. But in the case of, like, Pete Carroll not, not, telling Marsh, not giving it to Marshawn Lynch or uh, coaches not going for fourth downs, optimally one of the reasons that media pundits in america don't ever touch on is the asymmetries of cost to the decision makers it's because from as simple as being second guessed but also in terms of the long their longevity as in their employment the 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 problem is that in pete carroll's got a lot of autonomy over the seahawks organization he basically is general although he isn't the the de facto general manager He, he he, you know, he basically runs the, the show, but other coaches, they can be second guessed by higher ups. And so, like, even though everybody knows mathematically, you should go for virtually every fourth down, no matter how far it is from your 40 line, yard line onwards. Humans placed in that situation don't tend to do that because they don't want to bear the cost of a bad decision personally. And that's an interesting uh, sort of psychological way of looking at decision making. Of course, that's a, that leads you to a, a whole paradigm of its own uh, of behavioral economics and things like that, the, the, the way that humans interact with sort of the science of, of, of making decisions. Now, in horse racing, I can, I can immediately bring up a parallel effect, which is tactics, riding tactics. Jockeys generally are happy to go off too fast, but they are less happy to be blamed for coming too late. So as a result, in a game theoretical way of looking at that, there are, the, most races will always be run at a slower than average tempo uh, until the closing stage when jockeys will probably make frantic moves from like four furlongs out to a furlong out because they don't want to be seen to be lagging too far behind when the stands comes into view. Right? And when, when the action takes place in a horse race because blame is disproportionately attributed to jockeys who come too late. Now, as a result, jockeys who have patience, and a good example for that over here is Jamie Spencer, but there are others all around the world as well. Jockeys who can exhibit greater than average patience have a systematic advantage in uh, horse racing all the way around the world because they can they can get their horses to run more evenly because they're less concerned about they're able to go for fourth down more often. Or they understand that, that it's a waste of time punting. And, it, it, you know, in the equivalent, the, the metaphor for that. And as a result, they're able to, they've got more utility to make race winning decisions. And so, like, these things can, if explained in a more basic way, a more capable way that I'm doing now, can, can totally transform people's understanding of horse racing. And really simple ideas 
that they can take, and because everybody's got different brains that works, works in a different way, uh, they can take and they can use in their own way and they can find the whole thing a lot more interesting for the same reason that you and I have become NFL fans. We Neither of us have got any particular background or any reason to become in, inculcated into the American way or, you know, or kind of like liking the sort of machismo of American football and nothing could be further from the truth in my case. Yet there's something about it because it connects with the ideas that we've talked about last time and this time that make it so fascinating. Absolutely agree. And it's funny how the smart and courageous and good decision makers do what they do. And obviously you need to yeah. be in a position to be able to do that, let's say, or or the downside if you're Pete Carroll versus uh, you know, a first year head coach who's um, you know, hasn't run a team before. But I, I think it's it's that impact and then that compounds and then that's why you do have, you know, the Belichicks where he does what he does in the yeah. draft and he does what he does in free agency and he's happy to cut Jamie Collins and then no one bats an eyelid. I think quickly on, on the, the draft, one thing that occurs to me that, that is a systematic error in thinking now is the fact that the teams at the bottom of the draft, the, uh, historically, New England, Seattle recently, Baltimore, Pittsburgh formerly, uh, were fond of trading down in the draft and accumulating more picks. And this led experts to say, oh, well, you know, the reason for this is that, 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 the, it, that drafting college players is decision-making under uncertainty and there's so much randomness that you should have more tickets to the actual lottery of getting a great player. Aren't we gradually becoming to, to understand that this is wrong? In fact, what, what, what's really the case, what really makes Seattle win and New England win is not their brilliant drafting strategy, but the fact they've got Tom Brady and Russell Wilson. And that really, once you have, once you have an elite quarterback, your drafting strategy really doesn't matter as much as, as, as people make it out to be. But because you're Bill Belichick, people associate things that you do with being shrewd. And that's what makes the next NFL season when we actually come to play the games so, so fascinating because now the master has been divested of the, of the factor that actually makes him win games. And Tom Brady didn't play for the Cleveland Browns when Belichick was the head coach there uh, either. And so it's fascinating to disentangle the different factors that, that enable winning and losing in the same way in horse racing, one wonders, like, is John Gosden, Frankie de Tory, or John Gosden's owners the biggest factor in John Gosden's success? What is it that makes John Gosden win? Is, is, he, is, his, tra- is his decision-making, is his training, is his, the things he does in the mornings with his horses, is it really everything the media lead us to believe? Or is it some secondary set of skills being able to, being able to build up a coterie of owners and to keep them from infighting and to keep everybody happy. And then does everything follow in life from a single event or is it multifactorial as the media would have you believe? Is it, is, are, we, are we a function of all these brilliant different insights we really have? Or are we just very good in some cases at capitalizing on single events of, of either fortune or insight? It's a great question. And even if you think you know the answer, there's a good chance you're probably incorrect, which is fascinating. And all of this, you know, even the draft talk, um, I think it might have been a few years ago now, but I read, I think it was Cade Massey or one of those guys. It might have been Richard Thaler as well, yeah. talking about the draft and and that. And, and it's an evolution. It really is. And things change and college football changes and the NFL changes. And one thing, though, if, if I'm a quarterback, I don't want to be drafted in the top 10 necessarily. I'd rather be drafted in the, no. the bottom 10 of the first round and go to a, a good team, as happened to Lamar Jackson and and others but it it is interesting and one related point i guess to that is is the i i mean you talked about it last time we spoke about the best um the best playground to to pick up knowledge is probably going out and betting um yeah. and i wanted to ask a little bit about that but before i do just more so on the academic role in all of this uh and what how you see academia what role do you think is is optimal uh within what we're talking about for academia to play oh that's a really difficult question is it we talked last time I mentioned the, the fact that I had a dim view of many of the papers written on horse racing, not because they weren't, they had, they lacked, uh, in, they lacked insight or they lacked methodology. They were it, well, far from me to say anything like that, but more that, that if you're a domain expert, you can read them and in, immediately you realize they've taken shortcuts or they've, they have misapprehensions about the way that racing works in the same way that I might be able to understand through numbers 
American football. But if I was working in an NFL front office, I'd suddenly think to myself, oh, I see now why you can't do this. I see now why you have to punt on fourth down because <laughs> I went for it last week and I've never stopped answering questions since. So the realities of a situation are something are sometimes uh, very different for the analyst than kind of like the dry atmosphere of of the laboratory. Now, like it, as far as betting is concerned, I, th- I think that the skills required to make a very good better include some of the things that we talked about now and last time, but probably they include lots of other skills as well that have got nothing whatsoever to do with what we're discussing persistence and you know kind of like a, a sort of almost recklessness controlled recklessness would be perhaps a good way to look at it and sort of having confidence in um, a set of prior beliefs that outlast evidence as well and where, where a reasonable person might update their prior beliefs in the light of evidence that a very good better might stubbornly cling to a set of factors that actually was the right thing to do. Um, and so you know, we're, these, these people, we're, we're trying to tease out of people, including people on your podcast, what makes them successful. And, you know, I, I just think for want of another phrase, it is just a knack of something. It is, having, it is having a set of characteristics, either by nature or nurture, that predispose you to being good at something. And for reasons you don't necessarily know, but then when another person comes along and tries to apply them, following the wisdom of your counsel, it then becomes an example of those books that say how to get rich when 99.9% of people who followed the same set of principles would end up in a cardboard box in Pigeon Square. And so the, the whole topic is delightfully elusive, I suppose. And I'm sorry if I'm not producing a specific answer to that question, but I find that something that I, I, just, don't, I just don't understand quite yet uh, in my 50th year. No, it's it's uh, from a betting perspective anyway. When someone says I back tested my models and this is what it means, or I've done yeah some non betting related analysis, whether it's academia or, or more uh, more on the betting side like back testing, it, it's it's funny how there is obviously potential interplay and and there's a way that academia can re- react from from gambling and gambling markets, and I think vice versa. And just trying to find if there is any sweet spots within that, if there are. Some better ways to do it because it's funny the 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 one with the skin in the game betting every day will say ah, academia whatever tell me when you've been yeah. betting this and that and then academia will you know will say well you know it's intuition or it's a you have a an approach that not necessarily can be fully described because like you said part of it is uh, indescribable you know the way people do it and yeah. how they do it they might be able to explain it how they think it is whether or not that's fully true is another thing and then from there there's so many other elements that go into it just like the the example of, of Brady and Belichick you know there's no right answer uh, Frankie Dettori no. and these others that, uh, there's no right answer there isn't. And, and what they think may be less true than what you think about it so it is a it's an everlasting yeah. topic that will be forever uh, I guess or pundits will forever comment on yeah, the, the, the Bolton and Chapman paper, which was one of the foundational papers about like how to scientifically incorporate numerous different covariates into a model um, and then produce a betting profit there. When they tested their the, this is at the end, you know, the paper where they say, you know, after four or four hundred bets, it's absolutely ludicrous, like how the profits that they claim. However, what was significant about that paper, and I've forgotten when it was written, was the fact they kind of like popularized use of the condi- conditional logic model, which, of course, Bill Benter then went on to use to spectacular success and, and with his confederates. And so that's a good example of the part that academia can play, that when you read a paper about horse racing or baseball or football betting, you may not be able to apply or you might think it's ridiculous to apply the, expect to apply the methods and, and extract the same profit the academician claims it will give you an inspiration one thing in particular i mentioned david edelman earlier on um who's a a a very very good writer on horse racing he hasn't written enough but like some of the i I love to i've read a couple of his papers and got great ideas about how to handle things like for example how to how many lengths horses should be beaten at various distances like it's traditionally expected to be a linear function where you know sort of if you get two horses of known merit and let's say they both have 
it, they both stay forever, then if you run them against each other over a mile, the better horse might win by five lengths. And if you run them against each other for two miles, the better horse might win by 10 lengths. Well, of course, that doesn't happen. And you know from experience that actually as distances increase, the pace of the race tends to get slower. And so the horses are separated by smaller and smaller margins at the end of a race compared with what you might expect. Well, Edelman gives a specific function tested on data as to, ha you know, how to, how to do this in, in a mathematical way. And I found that of immense use, even if in Britain I had to use a different coefficient to him because our races are slightly strong, more strongly run than Australian ones. Uh, but that was a great example of the role that academics can provide uh, and why it's always worth. But I think we're a million miles away from solving the horse racing problem in terms of betting. And I think you know, that is very, very elusive, whether you use a neural network, whether you use Bayesian methods, some of which we were beginning to talk about last time out. And of course, there's another topic in itself. And is that the Bayesian methods are espoused by an increasing number of people who have got academic leanings, but they can't be actually applying them uh, in, in a practical setting because there are immense computational difficulties with using Bayesian models for horse racing because of the number of variables. Unless you use dimensionality reduction methods, that is you cut down the number of variables from the number that there are in horse racing, you know, sort of day since last run, trainer, jockey, owner, the latent ability of the horse, blinkers, visor, shape of track, pace, etc. Unless you have a very, very clever way to reduce the number of variables, then you're going to find Bayesian methods. You're going to find you'll be sitting in front of a cute computer for several hours before your computer comes, tells you what the posterior distribution for winning is. So, you know, it, it's it, academics has got a role to play, but we're a, an awful long way from solving horse racing. What are your thoughts on absorption then? Not necessarily only academia, but more broadly about whether it's someone listening to you today or if it's a previous guests or it's other shows. Do you have any thoughts on how the best way to absorb materials and apply them? You mentioned before you don't necessarily want to be following the how to get rich quick books and, and you might end up broke before you end up uh, anything else. But just just generally for those that, that do listen a lot or consume a fair bit or are in quarantine at the moment watching a lot of uh, suggested yeah. YouTube videos on different topics, what is there any overarching thoughts or principles around the best way to absorb? I do, yeah, 100%. I've got very, very strong views on this topic. And that is, like, let's say I'm talking to, or the person listening is a, is a graduate or a postgraduate or someone who you know has got feels like they've got tremendous energy to bring to the space and they've got skills from assuming they've already got all those data analytic skills and they don't need to learn about the scientific method they their number one task is to get hold of the data so they need to do a good web scraping course or they need or they need to be able to i don't know purchase some or and then after they've got the data which which they then they then just need to not to shut their ears to everybody else and they just need to apply the scientific method because i i believe that anybody that's got the the skills to handle any other situation uh, like from acad from academic settings or real world settings in, in decision making under uncertainty that they they're the type of person who's going to thrive now, let's say that you are semi-competent. I'm talking now to someone who's semi-competent at numbers. Maybe they can handle an Excel spreadsheet, but that's about it. So they need to teach themselves to program. That's ridiculously easy to do in the modern era. And the vast majority of people in society could learn to program in less than a week to a really good standard if they, if they first of all, if they, if they needed to. And second of all, if they had the, someone to sort of guide them a little bit. And there are plenty of online courses. But the most important thing in any of these settings is to understand the scientific method. So the the one, I don't recommend books a lot, but this is a book that's got nothing to do with horse racing, but it's, I read it first a couple, two or three years ago. And I just think that it is the best book on the scientific method. And it's called Statistical Rethinking by Richard McElreath. And McElreath is not just a highly talented author, but he's a brilliant lecturer as well. And he's put, um, lectures that guide you through his book, which is on Bayesian methods. But it's really about science. And it's about how to make decisions in science from data. It's a brilliant, brilliant book. And if a, if a young person read through that and understood fully 
like what the task of inference truly is, then they would find that horse racing or baseball or the NFL or all those things, any sporting setting out there gives them the perfect setting to actually apply those methods. Because as we said last time, unlike any other discipline where you've got to wait a whole lifetime to find out whether your methods are any good, you can do that in relatively short order in horse racing because there are so many thousands of races each year. You can find out where the long, the long term, the long run of your talents more effectively than you can in many other disciplines. And so the most important skill is, to, is science. Science, which is guiding us through these dark times now. Science is everything to the modern world. Science is our greatest, uh, by far our greatest success as a, as a species. And it's something which isn't just important in profound situations like uh, disease, but is absolutely fundamental to actually backing winners too. And anybody that's got those skills as long as, uh, and have all the other things that, that betters need will, will succeed. Yeah, no, it's a great point. I think that certainly in many aspects, that scientific approach and the rigor that comes with that and the the, uh, the yeah. way you approach those problems is, is critical. And I think it also ties back to what you were talking about before with self-assessment and knowing where you're at, knowing what skills you do have and what you don't have, if you're stubborn or if you're, um, you know, can you filter out the signal and the noise and things like that? Those are the yeah. the crossovers in some of this stuff. And I guess final question for you. Um, I don't think I asked this last time, but are there any betters or pundits or, or other people that have had a, a huge impact on you throughout the years? Is is it someone you may not have ever met, uh, buyer and venter and these types of guys, or is it someone else that, that springs to mind? I think they're people from outside sports, really. I think they're more writers of or lecturers in in statistics and maths, really, uh, be, just because mathematics is a very demanding canon to make interesting to somebody else. And, and as, as a, a failed media operator myself over the last 30 years, I've realized how difficult it is to do what they can do, which is to bring a subject to life, to make it's so interesting that it is it almost is emotional how good they are at writing and i could give you two or three names right now but these are you probably if you wanted to ever buy two textbooks on statistics the, the elements of statistical learning and the more accessible an introduction to statistical learning by hasty tib shirani again they do they do um online tutorials as well they're very very good and like further back, it's always been people like them that have kind of brought me along and inspired me. They, they haven't necessarily been racing writers because I think racing writers, generally speaking, there's some very, very good ones, very, very good ones indeed, far beyond my capabilities, but they never have never really inspired me in the same way. Bayer obviously was was a brilliant contributor in his time. I think his time has gone now, and uh, I think his methodology is a bit old hat now i think many people have moved past the kind of inflexible sort of approach that uh, he formally espoused and, and they're more towards some of these secondary methods that he laid out in one of his other books um but i think that the more you realize how um mathematics and statistics applies to horse racing and to other sports and betting the more interesting it all becomes like we said and i think those are the people Jim Albert is another writer. He's a he's a kind of uh, current current day Bayesian writer. Um, so people like that. He's written a very good book on baseball called um, Analyzing Baseball with R, which is a very good intermediate book. If you've already if you've learned R, maybe you've been an, an R coder for a couple of years. That's a great book to take you to the next level of coding. Um, and sort of there are many books that are highly recommended in the computational space that have been the things that have really inspired me to learn about math and stats i'm going to file failed media operator under the humble uh, category and we'll let others decide on it, that one it's disagree yeah that's it's fun it's true the evidence suggests it doesn't it i've, I've already told you to start the podcast i gave up through desperation in not being um effective enough in getting my <laughs> that's why effectively i was telling you i was claiming to be authentic and probably at the same time failing to be that uh you know immediately it it's probably just because it took me 30 years to realize that I wasn't very good. So I don't think that's necessarily being humble. I think the people, there are plenty of people listening to this podcast and otherwise would agree with you there. Agree with me there, sorry. 
it's it's fascinating i thank you again james for your time it's a pleasure chatting uh, i know i take too much of your time each time we talk but it, it's uh topics and areas that i love chatting with you about and i hope and i'm sure many will get a lot out of it and you know i'm sure we'll get to do this again i wish you very well on your path oh, post thank you very media much. And, and obviously what's to come yeah keep up the excellent work i really enjoy consuming the podcast i'm not just saying that it's something i look for every time a new one drops um i'm always immediately striking out on a dog walk for an hour or so so i can listen to it so congratulations to you and uh, it's been a valuable resource for all of us much appreciated